Today on the channel, I'm going to answer viewer questions. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to answer viewer questions. I've never done a video like this before and uh, you know, who knows what kind of views this is gonna get, but I figured it would be kind of fun to answer questions. I always get uh, really cool questions in the comments from everybody. Uh, we have a really great community on this channel. I can't thank you enough. I'm coming up close to 20,000 subscribers. I've, I'm hoping to break 19 this month. It's been a a great ride this past year and a half. I uh, still can't believe that that many of you subscribe to the channel and find my content that interesting, but I'm forever grateful. I'm going to keep it going, but I figured I would give back a little bit and answer some viewer questions. Not that I think I'm that important or that interesting, but it's just some new content for us here on the channel. So let's begin. I, uh, I answered, I'm going to answer some questions from my Instagram page. My Instagram page is linked below in the description, by the way. So please follow me on Instagram. It's Marty's Guitars at Instagram, Marty's underscore guitars. And I got some of my questions on that post, and I got some questions on a community post. Uh, if you have any more questions you'd like to see answered in a future video, comment below in this video. So the first question I've got is um, from... Uh, Hib VGH VVH VBJ B8561. That's a mouthful right there. Okay, so where do you get your guitar bodies for your builds? Okay, so my guitar bodies that I get, most of them I find on eBay. I love eBay. I know a lot of people love Reber Reverb and things like that, but I, I shop I shop eBay. I look on eBay, I set my price uh, thresholds for like 60 bucks and under, right? And you just type in guitar body or telly body or strap body and there's there's a ton of bodies you can get out there and and uh, and and find that are either loaded or blanks. I like blank bodies because if I want to repaint it or or finish it myself, if you buy a blank body, you don't have to do a lot of work to get the paint off of it, right? So uh, if you can find a loaded body or a body with a with a pit guard or a bridge on it, even better for 30, 40, 50 bucks. It's hard to find, but you got to keep looking. Sometimes marketplace, Facebook marketplace. I travel a little bit, and I'm always looking at some mom and pop music shops, uh, things like that. So, but mostly eBay. Just search guitar body and set your price maximum threshold for 60, 70 bucks. I try to set it for the United States just because it takes less time to get a body if you buy one from the United States, but sometimes, uh, you know, overseas isn't bad. I do the same thing for guitar necks, type in guitar neck or telly neck, strat neck, that, that sort of thing, and uh, it'll yield a lot of results. Usually I set my threshold at about 65 to $85 for necks. You just gotta keep looking, you gotta, you gotta keep, um, looking uh, you know consistently on a weekly basis uh, sometimes if you watch an item the sellers will offer you a discount so you might watch it for two or three days and then you'll get a notification that they're that they reduce the price which is kind of cool alright so the next question that we have here is I'll try not to be too long-winded I can be a little long-winded this next question comes from Rick KN uh, do you have a day job that isn't music related I have a couple of guitars to sell next year. Um, if I ship them to you, would you do a demo of my guitars? All right, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I do have a day job. Everything that I do these days is music related. Uh, I'm a guitar tech. I set up guitars. I do restrings. I set up violins, mandolins, banjos. I do rewiring work. Uh, I do all kinds of guitar work. So that's my, my main job. For years, I worked in telecommunications for uh, Verizon, and I was a manager at Verizon for a long, long time, and I, I early retired from that job, uh, but ironically, I was able to work there and manage a music career at the same time, so I, I traveled and I toured, I put out records and 
did the whole music thing while I was working in telecommunications. But recently, within the last year, I, I early retired and I've been doing uh, guitar setups uh, for uh, my profession. I also write charts and I'm a band director uh, for a uh, for a local church. We do uh, we do big big productions on Sundays where we we film and we have smoke machines and cameras and it's like a concert. Uh, we do a lot of rock, a lot of country, uh, things like that. You never know what's going to come up each week. So I chart songs for the band and I'm kind of a co-band director out there and that pays a little bit of money because uh, I do some work there and then I also do uh, my gigs. I work with a local band uh, and I do session work uh, and also YouTube. YouTube is a source of income as well so YouTube helps pay the bills. So everything I do is music related which is kind of exciting. Sometimes it's a little scary but hey you know things are going okay so all right, next question. Oh, I didn't answer the other part of that question. The other part was if you sent me a guitar, would, would I demo it to help sell? No, I would not, um, simply because I don't want to get involved in shipping a guitar back. I don't want to be responsible to ship it back. I hate going to the post office almost as bad as I hate going to the bank. Uh, no offense, I would love to be able to help you, uh, but um, you know, if you send me, if you send me uh, pictures of it, I'll post it on my Instagram, but uh, I, I really just don't have the capacity to receive and ship a guitar back. Although that sounds fun. All right, next question comes from Noel Camelio1194. Have you seen the newly unearthed Van Halen Castle Donington footage on YouTube before it got taken down? All right, so you know I, I did. I saw most of it and then tonight I found it again. I think it was the whole concert. Uh, it was pretty cool. I really enjoyed watching it. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you haven't seen it, anybody on this channel, you should be able to find it. Some people have been getting it reposted. It keeps getting take, taken down, I believe, uh, unfortunately. But it's it's pretty awesome, man. I it always cracks me up to see that old footage because, you know, uh, it's like Eddie wearing the the black and and yellow pants and the the football shirt. You know, it's like his uniform. <laughs> And uh, it's cool. I, I enjoyed seeing the video of Al playing the drums. Uh, at some, one point, the guy's right above the drums with the camera, and you can see all the Simmons drum heads and most of those, uh, you know, all the toms and stuff. It was just like for show. It was kind of fake, you know. It was all Simmons drums, <laughs> uh, and uh, I was like, wow, that's kind of neat. People always, you know, kind of rip on Al for doing the electronic drum kit on 5150, but you know, he was touring with that stuff. Uh, I enjoyed seeing uh, some of the people jumping on the stage and the security, you know, tackling them. When the, one, one dude almost got Eddie, man, one one dude almost went up and got, uh, you know, it looked like he was going to hug Eddie, not you know, cause him any harm or anything like that. Uh, yeah, so good video. Dave Dave Lee Roth's vocals were good. He sang awesome. He put on a heck, heck of a show. Uh, his uniform or his his outfits were pretty funny. At one point, he's wearing that shirt he pulls up like a halter top <laughs> i was like okay that's kind of wild the spandex uh but you know what a great showman and there was one part of the show where where roth goes up behind the or by the drums and the camera's not on him that's like over on eddie right and you hear roth say something like these stairs don't go anywhere uh, or something like that he's like against the he's against the backdrop by the drums i think he was trying to figure out where the steps were going to go. He had like, he was going to go do some stuff and <laughs> he got shut down. So cool show, you know, it looks like there's a school or something in the background. You got you know, 65,000 people. And then when they, when the camera goes off to the edge of the, or shows Roth on the side of the stage, you can see it looks like a, like a schoolyard. Uh, they're out in this field, but no one's out there. A couple people walking in the grass. I'm thinking, you know, I wonder what those people were thinking out there watching this Van Halen show. Uh, and then Roth peeks around the, the corner. He peeks around the, the PA speakers at one point. That was kind of funny. And Roth, when, when the band jams, the band jams a lot. And Roth is playing the, he, at one point he's playing like a steel cable that's holding up like a lighting rig. He's like playing like string bass. You know, he's playing along with the band. You know, Roth always had something to do when he was, when the band was jamming. Because, dude, I mean, Van Halen, uh, they just go off. And, and jam like uh, for minutes, several minutes, and leave you know Dave in the dust with nothing to do. <laughs> All right, next question. 
Mart Rock Cafe. Do you like Zach Wilde and can you make a video lesson on his style? Pinch harmonics and use of wah, chorus, roto vibe. Much appreciated, dude. Yeah, I like Zach Wilde. I really think he's, he's awesome. Uh, I think he's doing a great job with uh, Pantera on this tour. Uh, but, you know, my favorite Zach Wilde stuff was the first couple Ozzy records. No Rest for the Wicked was my introduction to Zach. I remember when that album came out. I had it on cassette. And Miracle Man, Devil's Daughter, all that stuff was so good. Uh, you know, Zach just came out of nowhere. Love that stuff. And then No More Tears is a masterpiece. I mean, production on it is so good. All the all the Zach Wilde stuff on all the Ozzy records is is excellent, really. I'm not a big fan of uh, the you know Black Label Society stuff. To me, it sounds it's a little biker, kind of sloshy metal sounding. You know, it doesn't doesn't it doesn't sound like. Uh, well, I won't go into it, but it just doesn't sound like there's a lot of thought put into it. But yeah, I can do a Zach Wilde lesson. Uh, sure, I need to think about the maybe some licks or a proper tune to do. But Zach, Zach was a big influence on me back in the 80s. Great, great player. I, I'm not a fan of his wild audio guitars. No offense if anybody out there has one. I think they're, um, they're cool if it's what you like, but I'm just not a fan of the shapes and the big block frets the big block inlays kind of cheesy kind of cheesy you know Schecter makes those I believe all right the next question is from Peter J Bailey 4012 what does your live pedal board consist of uh, and go to pedals old school question all right so live I play through my Friedman BE 100 and typically a 412 a Friedman 412 and a uh, or a 212 just depends on the gig but my pedal board is pretty basic, man. I, I have a tuner. I just have a little cord tuner, digital tuner, and uh, an EHX Crybaby. It allows me to do the talk box stuff and, and also a really great wah sound. Uh, it's a light Crybaby pedal. For years and years, for almost uh, 16 years, I used a Slash Crybaby, but it was so heavy. Uh, I wanted to decrease the weight of my pedal board, so I bought this EHX Cocked Wah Plus uh, or Cockfight Plus pedal. I love it. I've got a um, DL4, Line 6 DL4 delay, the big green delay that I run through my effects loop. Uh, so I got to have a little bit of delay for some of my solos. And uh, I've got a uh, TC Electronics. Uh, pipeline tremolo pedal and I use the pipeline tremolo live I use it as a booster pedal so if you turn all the effects down the tremolo but you just turn the volume up it makes a really nice booster pedal so I run the the booster and the delay through my effects loop so I can boost my solo since the BE doesn't really have a, a, a boost for like a channel for solos but that's it that's my live those are my live pedals tuner Crybaby pedal or EHX Cockfight Plus and the DL4 delay and my TC Electronics pipeline that I use for a boost. When I play in uh, around, you know, in the house, uh, I'm, when I'm sitting on the couch, I run through a Fender Champ and I run my Cockfight Plus. My I use my pipeline tremolo for for tremolo effects and I. Uh, recently just got a Cirrus delay and reverb pedal which I'm going to do a demo of the Cirrus delay and reverb is awesome for a long time I used a um, marine reverb the Fender marine reverb and a Fender space delay but uh, I gave those away to my son who's a junior in college he plays guitar and he needed some cool pedals so hey it's a good excuse for me to buy new pedals but that's pretty much it I've got a uh, Oh, a Sans Amp Tech 21 distortion pedal that I really like. It's from like 1990. It's got the little dip switches on it. Great, uh, great distortion pedal. Uh, I've got a Pussy Melter, <laughs> the Satchel Pussy Melter. That's a killer pedal. But live, I use my BE100 for my uh, for most of my power and very little effects. When I run direct, if I do a corporate gig or a hired gun thing where I got to use in ears, my Fractal X8 is my go-to. It's awesome. 
Uh, the Fractal X8 is a little old, but it's an excellent system and it's great for going direct. All right, next question. Let's see what we have. <laughs> 5150 Show. Hey guys, 5150 Show is great, man. Subscribe to their channel. Uh, why are you so freaking awesome? <laughs> That's not really a question. Um, man, I just do what I do and hope everyone likes it. I try to be honest and humble and no BS. So there you go. All right. My cat's bumping against my leg down here. This is my cat. Let me see what he's up to. He's like, he's a lunker. He's about 15 pounds. All right. I love running amps. Oh, this is from 59 Plexi. Was there a 59 Plexi? I think it was a 69, wasn't it? I love running amps in stereo. You have quite a few. I love the power of two heads and two 412s with a stereo chorus and very low settings just to give it more beef. Do you ever hook your amps up in stereo? Great question. Uh, I used to do that live. Uh, sometimes when I'm jamming at the house, I do it just because it sounds so awesome. But yeah, I've got a Morley AB switch and I used to run two amps all the time in stereo. I, I, for years and years, I played with a Bon Jovi tribute band called Slippery When Wet out of Atlanta. I started that band with Jason the singer and I always ran two amps at once. I toggled between several amps during my, you know, nearly a decade with that band. I did uh, my Carbon Legacy that I had, I had a Legacy at the time and a JCM 800 that I would pair together. Then I had a VHT combo that I did with a Fender Princeton in stereo. Uh, then I had a 5153 that I ran in combo with a JCM 800. Uh, so yeah, I love doing stereo amps. I never really ran stereo chorus. I just sort of did a wet dry thing. Uh, back in the 90s, I have, I still have it. I had a, a Digitech uh, 2120 Artist and I would run it through a power amplifier, a clean MOSFET Hafler power amp and I would run it in stereo with a with a you know a distorted signal or a clean signal and then I ran a Marshall Jubilee with a cabinet on the, cabinet on each side so I had four uh four 12s and it sounded like uh Queensryche had that big stereo thing going on but yeah biamping is awesome and it sounds so good I want to get that new uh that new Van Halen that EVH uh or I think it's Boss makes the the Van Halen delay i want to try doing a wet dry wet but man they're expensive i don't know if i'd get my money's worth out of it all right garrett eu2 dp says what van halen song would you say is the most complex throughout yeah that's a good question um i would have to say fair warning uh album has probably the most complex uh stuff like push comes to shove is is pretty complex uh some of the solos in there, like, you know, so this is love and, uh, you know, some of those solos are just super complex. Eddie's, Eddie's songwriting, especially in the early years, wasn't as structured, so it was unpredictable. And uh, just getting the feel down is really impossible on some of those songs because it was just his style. But, you know, I would say, uh, you know, so this is love or... Uh, Hear About It Later is pretty complex, especially that intro. Uh, gosh, from the Sammy Hagar years, some of the keyboard stuff, there's a lot of key changes that, that's kind of complex. Mine All Mine, Mine All Mine would require a lot of thought, you know, to go through that and play the solos right. And some of the less popular Van Halen songs like, you know, uh, Big Fat Money, the solo in Big Fat Money, or even some of the things like Pleasure Dome. Pleasure Dome would be, is pretty complex. Uh, AFU, Naturally Wired. <laughs> Diver Down, uh, the the one song there, uh, what, what is it? Uh, where they do the, the CB radio, the uh, Breaker 1-9 or whatever they're doing. That song, I can't think of it right now. <laughs> That song is is super complicated. Uh, good Lord, I can't even try that song. All right, next question. Hope that answers that. This is by Cool Breeze six eight seven seven. Can you teach us how to play? It's the right time. I think you might mean it's about time, which was off the the best of 
when they had that that little reunion with Sammy in 04, it's about time. That would be a good song to uh, to teach. Yeah, you know, I could I can try to drum that up. But I think that's what you mean. It's about time. All right, next question from Farm Sim Kid 01. What guitar that Eddie built himself was your favorite? You know, I'd have to say probably the probably Frankie, man. Frankie is Frankie's the perfect guitar. I really am fond of the 5150 guitar that you see in the 5150 tour, although there were about 16 of them. I like the 5150 headstock. I really thought the 5150 uh, guitar was was a beautiful looking Kramer. Uh, that or, you know, the Frankie with the beak neck from the 1984 and 83 tours. All right, next question. From Jeffrey Lowry, 9730. Hey, Jeff. Great supporter of the channel, man. I'm not sure what I, I would ask Marty. I guess I've always been curious about what your day job is and just how how you make a, how early you have to get up after making videos late, but that ain't really any of our business. <laughs> yeah, you know, I do my videos late um, sometimes. It's the editing that gets me. So usually I try to get about seven hours of sleep. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of a hired gun. I, I do hired gigs. I play any, you know, if, if the gig fits uh, and I can, book, I can book it, you know, I'll, I'll do uh, session work. I got people that send me tracks to do an email. Uh, I'm a band director, write charts, Nashville charts for a project. And I do guitar setups uh, for a national music chain, uh, small, small chain, but national. So I'm a, I'm a tech. And, uh, yeah, and a YouTuber. All right, next question. Try not to be too long-winded. BMAC5085, man. Uh, BMAC, you are always commenting. I love it. What was the moment that you decided, that's it, I want to learn how to play guitar, and what was the first ever song that you learned to play, Marty? You know, um, kind of a cliche answer. I always liked music. Um, I got the Ace Frehley solo record when I was eight. That didn't make me want to play guitar, it just made me appreciate rock and roll, okay? And I got Scorpions, Love It First Sting when I was 13, and, and uh, 1984 by Van Halen. But I hadn't really picked up a guitar yet. And uh, for Christmas I got a guitar, a Hondo Les Paul. And, uh, you know, it was Twisted Sister. I went and saw the Stay Hungry Tour. My brother took me to go see Twisted Sister on the Stay Hungry Tour, and it uh, destroyed me. It annihilated me. And when I saw Twisted Sister play in upstate New York, uh, in Binghamton, New York, at the Broome County Arena, it completely changed my life. I went from music fan and knowing a few chords on guitar to this is what I want to do. It was that powerful. And then later on, within the next couple of years, uh, after that, I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan play at Cornell University. I think it was the In Step Tour, the tour right after Couldn't Stand the Weather. And I saw the movie Crossroads. And after I saw Crossroads and Stevie Ray, it was, I mean, I was like, I couldn't believe you could do that on a, on a guitar, but that really inspired me. And that was in the middle of the 80s shred. Uh, 5150 came out and, and uh, Eat Em and Smile, <laughs> and you know, the list goes on. So it bit me hard and it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a bug of mine ever since. All right, so let's go to the next one from Eric May 9872. First song you remember hearing on the radio or record that made you want to pursue music? Probably the first real song that or record that really made me want to pursue music was, uh, you know, and well, that last question I should have said the Beatles. The, you know, the Beatles when when I was when I got Ace Frehley's record. And then a few years later, I got Love It for Sting and Pyromania by Def Leppard. I also started listening to Beatles records. My brothers and sisters are significantly older than me and were out of the house. So I got their records and they, they had Beatles records and Hey Jude, Revolution, Something. 
those really changed my life and I, I really wanted to be Paul McCartney. I, I wanted to be Paul but then some days I wanted to be John Lennon so I learned how to play piano and I learned how to play guitar and that made me want to pursue music but I just didn't know how to do it. So the Beatles made me want to pursue it. Um, the flash and makeup and pyrotechnics of the Kiss show and seeing Ace Fraley uh, and Gene Simmons and all the blood and stuff that 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 kind of made me want to pursue music also but then seeing Twisted Sister in concert that was the deciding factor in my life <laughs> all right next question finally finally questions from me would be uh, to learn how how you get your EVH tones so spot on uh, would be good to know amp settings, EQ, signal chain, etc. for your favorite all-around EVH type tone, especially for the foreign lawful carnal knowledge and balance era. I uh, would love it if you could do a tutorial on Runaround, which you played a little on your new White Frankie demo and the new Humans Being, which is one of my favorite uh, EVH tunes. Thanks for all you do and the amazing content. Sorry I cut off your screen name. I apologize for that. All right, so the first part of this question as far as how, how did I get my EVH tone so spot on, back in the, the mid-90s, I really started to research how does Eddie get that spongy tone, right? And a lot of it really is in your hands and, and uh, you know, depending on what area you're going for. If you're going for early Van Halen, the early sound, Eddie didn't use a lot of distortion. He didn't use a lot of gain at all, so you've got to have a barky, crunchy Marshall sound, and you got to have a lot of attack and play with a lot of conviction in your notes. And that's that's what makes Eddie's tone. You got a mid range, a lot of mids, uh, and it can't be it can't be really scooped like today's guitar players have a scooped EQ on stuff. It's got to be very mid range and a barky, gritty Marshally sound. It helps if you soften the sound a little bit with just a hint of delay. Just a little bit of delay, not very well, far in the mix, and maybe a little bit of reverb, just a little bit, because that softens that harsh Marshall sound a little bit. Uh, but that's uh, in a Phase 90 for occasionally, you know, Phase 90, Eddie used Phase 90 on his solos, but it's really in your hands, the attack and the approach, but you can't scoop your, your mids. you got to have a mid-rangey, barky Marshall sound, and... You know, if you want to add a little bit of overdrive to it, just if you get an overdrive pedal, not a distortion pedal, but an overdrive pedal, and you want to just push that gain on your amp a little bit more to get it a little spongier, that's how you get the early Van Halen sound. If you're going to go for the newer Van Halen stuff, like on or the later era, like for Unlawful Carnal Knowledge and Balance, if um, I get it through Pro Tools uh, in, on my channel, I run through my Fractal X8, but what I do is I run a stereo delay. Stereo delay is really the secret to getting the Van Halen, the modern EVH sound. Eddie would run about 250 milliseconds on the left and 500 on the right and it, it does this. It shimmers, right? And a little bit of a stereo chorus. You don't want to oversaturate it so it's really soupy. You want to you know, put it in the mix maybe about 20 percent and a sine wave chorus in stereo with that stereo delay and uh, you kind of have to still keep that mid-range tone for Eddie's sound. You don't want to be too scooped. you got to have it mid-rangey, but around for unlawful, unlawful carnal knowledge and balance, Eddie had a, a much higher gain setting, so you got to bring the gain up significantly for the, the later era Van Halen, you know, 90s uh, era. So that's how you do that. Um, I think that was... That was it. I will do, uh, I can do a, another tutorial on Runaround. I did an intro uh, for a lesson on Runaround, but I'd like to do that. And, uh, yeah, well, thanks for commenting. I appreciate that. Okay, I hope that answers your question. You just got to use your ears. Trust your ears when you listen to yourself. And remember, Eddie's sound on record was not exactly like it was live. The sound that you hear of someone on a record is the produced sound that's on the record. It's mastered and it's EQ'd with a global EQ and compressed. Um, Eddie's sound live was a little different than on record in the early years. All right, Victor Isari 4036. How do you feel ultimately about your decision to purchase a Chipson? Recently I purchased a Slash Replica and a Blackie Strat. 
I feel great about buying the chips in. It was 330 bucks. I got it off eBay. They shut down the listing uh, about a week and a half after I bought it. I think so many people on my channel found it. I, I think they just couldn't keep up with it. So that eBay store shut down. I don't think it was due to legalities. I think they just had to, I think they, that video of mine got about 140,000 views. I, I think they just got blasted with orders. So who knows, maybe Gibson shut them down. Um, I don't feel guilty about it. I, I went down to the Gibson garage. I've been to the Gibson garage a few times, but I went down there the other night for a Marty Schwartz uh, Epiphone release. And, uh, you know, cause I work in the music business. So I got a pass to go down there to see the Marty Schwartz Epiphone release. Really cool Epiphone 335 coming out. And I met Mark Agnesi and, you know, got in the vault and was hanging out down there. And Gibson is not threatened by Chipsons. I mean, I think they could care less. The big threat really is, is people getting faked out by Chipsons and buying something that they shouldn't. And that, that'd be awful. And I would never do that. I'd never try to sell my, my guitar as a, rep, or as a real thing. In fact, I carved the word fake in the back of the headstock. Anybody that knows anything about Gibsons would be able to tell that was a fake. But I liked it. Thinking about buying um, another Chinese replica in the future of another brand for a video. All right. Uh, Kervin Rodriguez, 1833, says, Here's my question. Can the Wolfgang Standard sound well when playing blues and jazz? Um, no. <laughs> Not really. Uh, I mean, jazz jazz is kind of mellow. It's it's a pretty good blues guitar, but the Wolfgang standard has a very very hot set of pickups. It's the same pickups that's in a in a Frankie, and it's really a hard rock metal guitar. You could play blues um, with it, uh, like Bonamassa type blues, like heavy blues, hard rock and blues, sure. But jazz, no, those pickups really are not uh, really not set up to play jazz. I would say, um, you know, the Wolfgang's a great guitar. Even the, you know, the Indonesian ones, and I think some are made in China. They're all, they're all good. I've never had played a poor Wolfgang, but no, it's not really a jazz guitar. If you want to play jazz, get you an Epiphone Casino or a 335, something with P90s in it, or find you an old Silver Tone, something you know from the 60s or 70s, semi-hollow uh, or hollow body electric, uh, you know, with a nice warm neck pickup. That's my suggestion. Or an Ibanez Art Core, those are nice. But man, the, the Epiphone 335s are beautiful. Uh, I'd recommend that. Or a Sheridan. Sheridans are beautiful. The Epiphone Sheridans, if you can find a good deal on a used one for like 500. Nice black one. Tree of Life on the headstock. Gorgeous. All right, Bihar says, what were your thoughts on the state of the band at the time when Dave left? And when Sammy joined. I wasn't around then, so it's interesting to know what the general sentiment was. All right, so my general sentiment is I loved the when Van Halen and Sammy Hagar uh, joined forces because I was 16 at that time. I just was learning how to drive and had my first girlfriend, and it brings back such good memories that I have very, very fond memories of 5150. Plus, it was a great album. It was a great summertime album. And Dave split off and did Eat Him and Smile, which was another great album. So it was like having two of the best, it was like, you know, it was like double whammy. It was like double Van Halen, right? Uh, I wasn't emotionally invested in classic Van Halen because I was too young to grow up with it. So, uh, you know, guys who are, you know, in their late 50s or early 60s uh, are very, very, uh, a lot of them are very adamant that, you know, that, that first era of Van Halen was the best and that's probably because that's what they grew up with and they associate coming of age to that plus you know let's face it the first six Van Halen albums are flawless it's like the first uh, six Zeppelin albums I mean it doesn't get any better than the first six Van Halen records with David Lee Roth but to be able to do that again with Sammy Hagar and duplicate success and move on uh, I truly feel that if Dave would have stayed with Van Halen, they wouldn't have had continued success that they experienced. Sammy kind of breathed new life into the band. He inspired Eddie, and Eddie took off with keyboards and different songwriting because that was the 80s. 80s was, 
uh, uh, metal, but it was also a lot of new age British rock and pop stuff. Synthesizers were just getting to be really good. Multi-timbral instruments, you know, the Roland stuff, the DX7s, the D10s, uh, the Junos, all these keyboards were coming out and it was exciting because MIDI was was becoming very, very popular and successful. Howard Jones was out there. Frankie Goes to Hollywood, all the pop stuff, the Madonna, the, uh, you know, so that synth stuff, Eddie was inspired by it, I'm sure, even though he says he didn't listen to music. I, I know he did. Peter Gabriel. Uh, so it was cool, you know. Uh, Sammy breathed new life into the band and inspired Eddie, so I was along for the ride, coming of age. And I've always been a huge uh, Van Hagar fan. In fact, I got a Van Hagar tattoo on my arm. But I like both eras. But I was not emotionally invested in the David Lee Roth Van Halen era because I was too young. Although I liked those albums and tapes that I had, uh, I was just really getting familiar with that material when Sammy joined the band. All right, from Just a Boy. Hey, Marty, I was... Wondering uh, what piece of gear that you own that you think deserves more attention than it gets. Similarly, do you think there's a piece of gear that uh, people hype up too much? Um, you know, a specific piece of gear that I, I've got a lot of guitars. I'm not flexing. i got a lot of guitars. and So some don't get a lot of love, and they should, right? But I would say um, probably my American Professional 2 Strat. I love it so much, but I rarely pick it up because I'm a Les Paul guy and I love my my Super Strats, my Frankie Super Strats. Uh, so if I'm not playing my Les Paul, I'm playing my my Frankie Replica or my new Frankie Relic series guitar. Uh, but my American Pro 2 Strat is absolutely beautiful. They're one of the best Strats I've ever played in my life. Um, also my Ibanez Gem that I don't play frequently, and a Joe Satriani, a really nice Satriani Ibanez that I don't play. I, I don't bond with wizard necks that well, but I like a fatter neck, but I should give my Ibanez's more love. <laughs> Maybe I'll start playing them more in my videos. Uh, is there a piece of gear that I think people hype up too much? Yeah, man, I think people hype up... Um, I really think people hype up like Kempers and Helixes, uh, and fractal stuff a little bit too much. I, even though I use a fractal, uh, nothing beats a tube amp in my mind. Nothing. They're cumbersome and they weigh a lot and they're kind of limiting and I totally support technology, but I think that, I think technology gets too much hype in general and plugins and it gets to the point where everybody just sounds kind of the same. But I really like a good tube amp. The only reason I use my Fractal for, for uh, YouTube is because I can run it in stereo and Pro Tools and I get a consistent sound without having a mic. And it sounds great. So, Rocket5150, how did you learn to work on your own guitars? The job on your latest Frankenstrat was awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Some people, you know, no matter what you do on YouTube when you do a video of you uh, putting a guitar together, something there's always comments you know people are like oh you don't know what you're doing you made a mess of that and I will admit it you know sometimes I do sometimes I work kind of quickly on my stuff but how did I learn how to work on my own guitars out of necessity um, I have you know a lot of guitars and I've played used to play a lot of shows man you know every two or three shows a week for over a decade you know and it's it gets expensive to fix stuff so you learn how to solder and you learn how to through trial and error, kind of like how Eddie learned how to work on his guitars. You mess a lot of stuff up, man. You, you screw up a lot of things, and then you get it fixed, and you see how it's done. But you got to kind of look at, tear apart guitars. you got to look at how they're made. You know, if you want to wire a guitar, look at another one that's wired and copy that. Before I had internet, I had to look at other wiring, and you didn't, couldn't just Google, you know, what's the Seymour Duncan JB wiring for, you know, two humbuckers and a toggle switch. Now you can just look anything up or how to wire EMG 81s and active pickups and Fishman's and things like that. It's all on YouTube. So you got to use YouTube and Google and stuff because a lot of that stuff is available, but you just got to be patient and not be scared to try it uh, by yourself. Uh, I started making guitars maybe seven years ago. I started making 
single cut Les Pauls with glued on necks, you know, from kits and I made strats and I made telecasters and you can buy some really affordable kit guitars and you know you can buy kit guitars on Amazon for 110, 130 bucks, 140 and that's not a lot of money to screw up something and that's how you really learn. So I, I built maybe about 40 telecasters and strats and a couple of Les Pauls and I'd sell them to people for the cost that it you know I had in it you know a couple hundred bucks or something or give them to relatives but you gotta learn how to just you know buy some kits and learn through uh, your mistakes work on painting and dyeing the wood and soldering and adjusting necks and tremolos start working on your own stuff if you get in the weeds ask questions ask somebody all right um will you make a lesson on the darkest side of the night not familiar with that uh song i could look that up i'm not opposed to trying to but i'll tell you most of the time my lessons are devised around songs that i know so i have less research because i want to be able to put out content quickly and weekly and I know if I know the songs by heart or I've played them for a long time, I can teach them better. And I also have to consider, you know, what's going to get views because let's face it, you know, I do YouTube as a side income, so I got to have views. So that's a balance of what I know and what I think will get views. But I appreciate everyone's suggestions. It really helps me guide the channel and the lessons. All right. And we've got two more questions. Would you be, uh, it'd be inter would be, I'd be interested to hear more about what your live rig setup are. Uh, you know, I answered this earlier. I just use a few pedals. My Friedman BE100 and a 4x12 Crybaby tuner and a delay pedal and a volume boost through my effects loop for my solos. My delay goes through my effects loop. If I'm playing a corporate gig or playing at church or doing something that requires uh, you me to go direct I use my fractal x8 I have a sir badger setting on there that I tweaked that's really nice with my impulse responses and a Friedman BE that I use on the channel all right and the last question is from RVK 5150 my question um, is how do I know when it's love well you know I can't tell you but it lasts forever <laughs> on a serious note I don't know how do you know when it's love it's just something you feel together <laughs> this is getting really corny but I guess Sammy's words were right uh, so anyways I really appreciate everybody that wrote in questions this was fun hope it wasn't too boring thanks for hanging in there if you made it this far if you like this kind of content please consider subscribing and uh, comment below and we'll do another one of these if if y'all like it so until next time please subscribe and peace out